Uh, yeah, it's great to be here. So as uh, Gigi said, said, I am a, an economist by training. Please don't hold that against me. Um, I have uh, certainly uh, left the, the ivory tower and have been working um, in commun at the community grassroots level for a long time. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about solidarity economy today, but let me just first start with um, where we are today. Um, I think more than ever, more than ever, we need to think about a new system. In this climate where so many of us are really feeling a lot of fear um, with, with the kind of hate mongering and the xenophobia and the kind of um, the over-the-top nationalism, scary times. Uh, I think a lot of us will feel uh, stymied uh, around work at the federal level. Um, so we need, I think we need a vision. We need to come, around, come together around a vision that is about solidarity and about caring for each other and celebrating the, um, the loving side of, our, of, the, of human nature. Um, and we may well have to be fighting a lot of our struggles and we may well have to be doing the building at a more local level, um, both because there might not be those uh, opportunities at the federal level, uh, although they've been, been somewhat closed down for a long time, um, but also just for survival. Um, I think we're facing hard time in communities for a number of reasons, but one being the, the um, incoming administration. And so for, in the interest of survival, I think a lot of that building and organizing is going to come down to the more local level. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, we really need to think about what, as we build, right? It's not only about resistance, we need to resist, but we also need to build. So what are we building? If we're, if we're thinking about a new economy, what does that mean? So um, I want to start with just the term new economy. It's a bit of an empty signifier. It's new, new as opposed to what? Um, a lot of you maybe are familiar with the New Economy Coalition. How many people know New Economy Coalition? Okay, so a lot of you. Um, so I do want to say a little bit because people often ask what's the difference between New Economy Coalition, new, that definition of New Economy, and Solidarity Economy. Um, we're both talking about uh, change, right? We're both talking about building a, an economy that works for people and planet. Um, and this is not meant in any derogatory or or a negative way, but just to make the distinction, what distinguishes solidarity economy is that we are very clear that um, we're talking about fundamental change, systemic change. We're talking about a post-capitalist vision. So I'd say that that's really the, the divide. There's a huge overlap between new economy and, and solidarity economy, huge overlap. Um, but the, where we do differ is that solidarity economy is clear in our belief, and I want to offer this to you. I know you're not all in agreement with that, but I'm offering this as, a, as something to think about, that we are not going to survive capitalism, given its grounding, given its principles, and, its, and the systemic... Um, the systemic laws of motion of capitalism. And I'll get into that in a, in a couple seconds. Um, so I, I want to talk about um, first, uh, when, when I talk about capitalism, people often come back and they say, capitalism, who knows what capitalism is? It's so hard to define. I'm going to give you five characteristics of capitalism because if we're going to change our system, we should understand what we're trying to change. So uh, here are the five characteristics that the Center for Popular Economics has been using for 30 some years. Um, one is about uh, private ownership of things like factories and the land and the equipment. Sometimes we call that private ownership of the mass, the means of production. Okay, private ownership, production for profit, profit maximization, wage labor, 
very key. You have an owner and you have workers and therefore you have two classes. Um, we have market exchange, right? Buying and selling is adjudicated by markets and prices. And the fifth thing is commodification. So commodification means that you're producing for sale as opposed to use. So if you uh, have a garden and you use your own, you, you grow your own fruits and vegetables and you give it to the neighbors, that's not a commodity. It's a commodity when you produce something for money. You put all that together and that is capitalism. One thing alone does not make it capitalist. So for example, there are a lot of people who think that say a cooperative is a capitalist enterprise, but it's not. It does operate in a market it does seek to make a, a surplus or profit, but it doesn't have owner worker. So it's, it's not. So I wanted to, to paint that systemic picture that you need not just one. Markets alone are not a problem. Uh, making some surplus or profits is not alone is not a problem, etc. But you put it all together and there is this toxic drive for the system to grow and maximize profit and not only is it deadly in terms of where we are, right, where, where Donald Trump can say, yeah, I didn't pay taxes, that makes me a good businessman, right? When that is the value that's separated, there's something wrong with that. Um, so we're talking about a fundamentally different system grounded in different values, okay? Um, and so that's, that's what solidarity economy is about. Solidarity economy is a growing global movement, just to give you a sense of its, its uh, expansion. Um, there are two countries that have enshrined it in their constitution, um, Bolivia and Ecuador. There are, are a number of countries that have ministries or departments of solidarity economy, so France, Luxembourg, Brazil, uh, to name a couple. Um, there are many more countries that have national framework legislation to promote the solidarity economy. Uh, so the government is obliged to look for ways to support solidarity economy. Um, the, the United Nations has an inter, interagency task force to support the solidarity economy. The International Labor Organization uh, runs an annual solidarity economy um, academy. Um, and we have an international network that connects the, all the national networks. So it's a network of networks called REPES. So U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, it represents the United States to that international network. Um, so that just gives you a sense of the growing legitimacy and momentum of this movement. Okay, so, so what is solidarity economy? It's... it's grounded in principles, and um, there are five that we use in the United States that'll look a little bit different in different countries, um, but I'd say at the core, we, we really do have convergence. So the five we use in the United States are solidarity, um, democracy. So we're not only talking about democracy in elections, we're talking also about democracy in community and decision making, and democracy in the workplace. So this is why we very much embrace um, collective ownership of the workplace. So it might be a cooperative that's owned by workers or it might be owned by the community in some way. Okay, so that's very important, the democracy. Um, sustainability. Um, uh, equity, so we talk about equity in all dimensions. So race, class, gender, etc. Um, I'll come back to that. And the, f the last one is pluralism. So by pluralism, what we mean is it's not a one-size-fits-all model. We don't have a blueprint, and we're, solidarity economy is not saying this is right, this is wrong. There are many paths to the same end of building a more just and sustainable economic system, um, and different things are going to work in different places. Given history, given hi given history and politics and um, culture, um, so it's not like we have a line or a blueprint and that we're ideologically rigid. So those those are the principles, and what solidarity economy does is it's 
It's looking out there in the world and looking for practices, enterprises, but also practices think, uh, that align with these values. So, for example, an enterprise might be a co-op, but another practice might be participatory budgeting, right? Um, one thing I want to pull, pull out is that we really do put at the core uh, the, the issue of equity. Um, just to give you an example of why this is so important and why we have to always very deliberately, very consciously keep this issue at the core, social justice and equity at the core. Um, I'll just give you an example, example from my neck of the woods, the Pioneer Valley, right? Connecticut River runs, run, runs down through the Pioneer Valley. Um, in Western Mass, we have an unusually high density of worker co-ops, which is great, which is great, absolutely wonderful. Um, but they are almost exclusively above what we call the Tofu Curtain. The Tofu Curtain is the Holyoke Mountain Range. Above the Tofu Curtain in the upper Pioneer Valley are the five colleges. Right, and so it's a kind of you know it's progressive and, and liberal, and that's where all the worker co-ops are. And below the tofu curtain, there's very little in the way of of co-ops. Um, so so the the organization that I co-direct, Wellspring, one of the, one of the reasons why we operate in Springfield is to try to to make relevant uh, worker co a worker co-op model in uh, urban. Uh, low-income communities, many of these are communities of color. Um, ultimately, if we cannot make our practices relevant to these kind of communities, poor communities, communities of color, marginalized community, then we're not building the economy that we say we want. It is not just, um, it is not equitable. And in the long run, I would say it's not sustainable. So it's really important, and I think solidarity economy consistently keeps the equity piece front and center, because you have to. You just have to. If you're not consciously pushing that, by default, um, people with, uh, that, are, that have more access, that have a bit more privilege, um, they're going to be able to do a lot of this innovative stuff, which is not, not putting it down at all, but just saying that we, you have to very uh, deliberately make sure that it's being inclusive. Um, Okay, so what I wanted to, to do is a little bit of uh, interactive stuff. Um, solidarity economy ex exists in every sector of the economy, in every economic sphere. And so what I wanted to do is to have you take a crack at populating the spheres. So um, think about the principles, the five principles, and think about what practices you know of maybe you're part of, um, it could be local or it could be not local, that align with these values, that would align with solidarity economy. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think maybe what we'll do is try to have two, these two tables. If you can think about production, okay, think about examples and there's a piece of paper on your table, I think that you could use. Or, or, or else you could put them on the sticky notes. Um, so production, co-ops have already been mentioned. I also want to suggest to you that solidarity economy embraces things that are monetized, paid for, right? Wage labor, wage that are paid, monetized, but also things that are not. Okay, so I, I invite you to think about that. Um, how about these two tables here? Think about um, distribution and exchange. So, for example, fair trade would be a kind of uh, exchange. Um, various kinds of local currency, for example. Um, so, these two tables. Uh, how about these two tables? If you can think about consumption, ways in which you're consuming. I'll give you a, a, one hint is that a lot, think about ways of collectively consuming. <laughs> and controlling and managing. Um, that table back there, think about finance. Uh, one big one, I'll just tell you right now, is credit unions. 
So we've done this mapping of solidarity economy nationally. Credit unions totally swamp the map because um, they're, they're a kind of a co-op. And you folks, can you think about governance? Things like participatory budgeting. But mind you, solidarity economy includes things that are uh, old, very old, includes some things that are innovative and kind of new. It includes things that are alternative. It also includes some mainstream things. Think about the values. Okay. Um, all right? You got your assignments? Take about, I don't know, we'll see, maybe five minutes to come up with a few examples, and then we'll, we'll, we'll feed them back. I do want to also mention again participatory budgeting for those of you who knows participatory budgeting some people not so participatory budgeting is where so for example in there's a few um, uh, yeah I'm trying to think oh, are they wards are they anyway city councilors who have turned their budgets over to their constituents and there's a whole process for people to um, have input and to make decisions about how that money is spent. So yeah, Boston, New York, Chicago, uh, there's a bunch of other cities. It's very much growing in popularity. Started in Brazil, has exploded um, throughout the world, very strong in Latin America. Um, the, the other one on governance that I want to mention is, um, is, is, yes, thinking about the commons, right? Thinking about what we should um, own and manage collectively things like big things like uh, water, like air. Um, there are some interesting examples of community management of, of commons resources. Um, one of the best examples is in Nepal where uh, most of the forests are owned by the government, but the communities are, are required to come up with a plan for how to manage and use and share the, the benefits of, of the forest. So they very much control um, how, who gets to log, who gets to uh, you benefit from it, um, how do you share that out with the community. So it's a good example of sort of common pool resource management. Um, so these are all great, great examples. So rem, rem, think back to the definition of capitalism and one of the goals that's clearly, clearly ingrained, right, in the system is profit maximization and growth and competition, right? And so what the, this, is, this is exactly what I'm saying, right? The very fundamental assumptions about a capitalist system, going back to Adam Smith, laying out these principles, right, are, it's, it's problematic. It's very problematic when, when your goal is growth and profits at the expense of all else. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So solidarity economy um, very much is informed by a lot of indigenous views. Um, it really emerged simultaneously out of Europe, France, and Latin America. And so a lot of the struggles in Latin America were very much um, informed by indigenous worldviews. And so the countries that have really embraced and put um, solidarity economy in the constitution are very much uh, Bolivia and Ecuador very, very take very seriously indigenous worldviews. Solidarity economy on the international level has um, embraced um, uh, Buen Vivir or uh, Sumat Kausi. It's a worldview that says that what we're about is um, living well. Not good living, like we need more and more stuff but living well. So it's harmony with each other and harmony with Mother Earth. And part of that, which I, I want to mention, also means respecting the rights of Mother Earth. So Solidarity Economy has endorsed that idea. So the Earth, the ecosystem, our local ecosystems have standing, right? So if you're doing this, it doesn't mean you can't use nature, but if you're using it to the extent that you're destroying an ecosystem, that's not that's not acceptable. Um, so th those are some of the principles. Yeah. Um, this doesn't get said very much in some of our meetings, but uh, we think we, we are heart-based first. And then we use our, our brain or our thinking, if you like, to support our heart and intellect. We're normally the other way around. Right. We all do it all in our heads. 
Yeah. So I want to try to wrap up with this. Um, so as an economist, I want to reflect on, on why that is, right? We have our heart part and we have our head part. So capitalism, right, from a theoretical, from as an economist, I will tell you the model is grounded in some assumptions about human nature, right? So we have this guy named Homo economicus, really, a guy. It's economic man, right? This is the assumed um, character at the center of the story of the economy, right? Homo economicus is rational, self-interested, right? Concerned about maximizing um, his own bang for the buck. Um, he's competitive. He's not only rational, he's calculating, right? He's always trying to figure out how he's going to get the most for the least effort or the least money or whatever. Um, uh, think about that, homo economicus. This is, this, the economy is grounded in the assumption of, and I'm not going to deny that's part of human nature, right? But there's also another side of human nature that isn't in this character, is not in homo economicus. So capitalism is built on these assumptions about who we are and things follow out of that, right? It's very problematic, very, very problematic. And so I think we do need to think about homo solidaricus, Right? That not only we have, we, we can't be naive and say that we, we as human beings don't have a competitive streak, that we don't think about ourselves, that we don't calculate, right? That all that head stuff. But also recognize that there's the heart in all of us, in every culture, everywhere in the world, right? We love, we have solidarity, there's altruism, there's kindness, and we feel good about that, right? And that's the solidarity economy wants to build an economic system and society and world where we're our whole selves, recognizing both that rational calculating, self-interested, but also our higher, our, our higher selves, our better angels. Um, and so let me just close with a quick kind of metaphor story. Um, so I'm going to tell you about metamorphosis and the story of the butterfly. So probably a lot of you know this already, so um, sorry if it's repetitive. So when a caterpillar um, spins its chrysalis, what happens to its body is it starts to dissolve in this nutrient-rich goop. And what starts showing up in that goop are what are called um, imaginal cells. And these cells have a different vision of what the caterpillar could become. And it's so foreign to the caterpillar that the caterpillar's uh, surviving um, self-defense uh, mechanisms attack these imaginal cells, and they're killed off. But these imaginal cells keep pop popping up, and then more importantly, they start finding each other and clustering. Um, and then they start surviving. And there are more and more of these clusters, and then they start to specialize. Right? So something becomes an antenna, and something becomes an eye, and something becomes a wing, etc until it evolves into and emerges as a butterfly. So that's met the metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And I would offer to you all those examples that you gave in all this, these spheres. It exists. There's this huge base upon, a huge foundation upon which to build. And you can think about all of those practices as imaginal cells and imagine the power if we can get them pulling in the same vision and sharing at least a common, a common uh, project of building an economy and a society that really puts people in planet front and center in the core of it um, and celebrates the whole of ourselves, including our higher, our higher better angels. Um, so I leave you with that um, image of imaginal cells and, uh, and building solidarity economy. Thank you.